Well, greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well today. Today, I have one heck of an upload to start the day off with before we jump into it. A couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch is displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It doesn't cost a cent. Click that like button. Takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon and folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all these things really do help the channel to continue to grow and go. And yes, folks, they definitely do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump in to today's upload, shall we? Today's first experience on the paranormal side. Ten years ago. My parents' house is a very, very, very old house in Europe. That was a farm in its early years. The two houses that surround it were the barns, and our cave is under one of them. It's a nice and inviting house. Nothing creepy, a lot of light in the day, it always felt cozy. I love that house. But when I was about 12 to 14, strange things started happening. At night, I was hearing someone walking up and down the stairs, and when I'm saying, I am sure it was the sound of someone walking because I knew all of the sounds of my house. I've never been a believer in ghosts, so for me, it was my dad having insomnia or going to the toilet, but he was making a lot of noise and was going up and down all night. I was clearly annoyed by these noises, so one night I was going to confront him while he passed my door. I opened the door and there was no one. Chills. But, okay, I must be dreaming. Then we started having other problems around the house. The walls are hollow and weasels got in and died multiple times. Hogs came to the garden and destroyed several things. The neighbor, who was a hunter, killed them and... We gave them to the butcher, who made good recipes with them. And then my mom's car had all her tires cut by a knife, and we don't know who did it. One day, my grandmother told us to make a cross with salt under the rug. She did not believe in God or what, but she believed in witches and, in her words, knew some. This was her way of getting the bad spirits or bad people to repel we did it for a good time, I guess. I don't know, thinking that it wouldn't work. It worked. I never heard the steps on the stairs again. No weasels died in the walls since then, and no cars have been attacked. I was thinking that it was my imagination, but the other night I talked to my parents for the first time because we were talking about my grandmother who died this year, and they said they also lived in weird things in this house which ended at the moment we put the salt cross down. They never told us because they didn't want us to have nightmares. So that's my encounter. Or maybe the story of a creepy dude who lived in the walls of our house. Also, my dad doesn't believe in the paranormal or God, and we think it could have just been our imaginations. My mother and brother believe in the paranormal. My great-grandmother lived in the French Reunion and was into voodoo and voodoo puppets. My mother always believed that her grandmother had some kind of powers. And for the joke that I'm always making fun, she thinks I've inherited it. Today's second experience on the paranormal side, this may be a dogman encounter in the United Kingdom. 
I live in the United Kingdom, and my friend's uncle owns quite a bit of land. We go hunting quite often. We hunt pheasant, rabbit, squirrel, and duck, so there's no need for any high-powered guns. And we usually take air rifles. Obviously, rabbits are nocturnal, so most of the time we set up camp and go off with flashlights up at the top of the land where there is less woodland and more of a chance of finding a rabbit. But on this night, I suggested we go down to the woodland area, as I've seen a few rabbit den down near the creek. My friend was very against going down there and made it clear he wanted to stay up in the fields. I told him, fine, I'll just go off on my own and see what I catch. I get down to the top of the creek. The creek is a very large dip in the ground where a stream running at the bottom and as I near the creek, I remember hearing splashing and kicking in the stream, which I thought must have been the rabbits. But when I looked through my scope, there was too much vegetation and I needed to get closer. I started down the very steep side of the creek, and as I'm coming down, I notice a white glint in the corner of my eye. And when I look, I notice it was bone. I thought it was quite cool and wanted to get a closer look. Upon said closer look, I can see quite clearly that it is a full-grown female deer. This is strange, because as I said before, I live in the United Kingdom, and we don't have a lot of predators down south where I was, so I thought of all kinds of things it could have been. My friend's uncle? No, he doesn't have a deer hunting license. A very, very large fox? No, I doubt a fox could kill a deer of this size. In the end, I came to the conclusion that it had fallen down the creek and broke its leg and had left there to die. I started to walk back up the side of the creek when I heard some rustling on the other side, I think rabbit, and I scope in to take a closer look. Then whatever I was looking at sprinted away, making me jump. But it wasn't any normal sprint. It was a two-legged charge, and I could see leaves rustling behind it as it ran that were taller than myself. This thing was huge, and I was defenseless with just an air rifle, but the sheer force that this thing ran with was enough to make me chill. So I hurriedly walked back up to the creek, to the fields, and told my friend what had happened, and I asked him if he was trying to scare me. He swore on his life that he had been up there the whole time. After no luck catching any rabbit, we went back to the tent to get some rest, but I couldn't sleep thinking about that thing and what it could have been. My heart dropped. The loudest, blood-curdling scream made me jump out of my skin, and my friend woke up in a fluster asking, WTF was that? It was silent for a few moments, and then it happened again. The scream rattled on for almost 30 seconds, and my friend suggested it was just a fox. But we had heard fox screams many times before, and this was not it. This was something larger than a full-grown man, full man's scream. But we were in the middle of nowhere, and no one would be out here walking around at this hour. Rest assured, we did not sleep the rest of that evening. Today's third experience on the paranormal side. So when I was 12 years old or so, my best friend and I were super into all things paranormal. We would purposely seek out situations that would expose us to ghosts, entities, and things. And I firmly believe if you go looking hard enough, you begin to open the door to these occurrences. We often had our parents take us to Savannah, Georgia, known for being a particularly haunted city due to its history, to stay in the same hotel a woman had killed herself in, in hopes of seeing her, ghost tours, you name it. Now, unfortunately for us, most of the time we never experienced anything. However, the scariest experience I had with her has always came back to my mind over all of these years. I always try to rationalize it, but to this day, I haven't been able to come up with a good explanation. I'm hoping maybe someone will. We are from a small town in Georgia. Milledgeville, notorious for its old, now mostly abandoned, insane asylum, Central State Hospital. 
It has a cemetery with many paranormal sightings and an extensive history. It's called Memory Hill. The night before Halloween, and we decided to be reckless and go to the cemetery and do all of the things you are not supposed to do. There was a wrought iron fence surrounding the plot of graves there, and the fence looks like it has little devilish faces in it, believed to have warded off evil spirits. On All Hallows' Eve, it is said you can hear the wailing and screaming coming from this area in the cemetery. The tale goes that you are not to touch the fence on Halloween, as not to release the evil. So, of course, we decided to touch it. There is a witch's grave there from a woman named Dixie Haygood, who lived from 1861 to 1915. Legend goes that you are not to cast a shadow on her grave or you will bear the full weight of her curse. She was believed to have cast before she died, so naturally we did that as well. There's a mausoleum there from William Fish, who had his wife and daughter taken by the typhoid epidemic in 1872. After he constructed the mausoleum, he himself entered inside closed the door and shot himself to be with them. Legend has it that if you knock on that door, you may hear a knock in reply. We knocked, no reply. When we were leaving, we noticed a friendly black cat in the cemetery. She was very sweet. Came up to us purring and rubbing on our legs and followed us for a while. My friend's mom, our ride, is an avid animal lover, and we all agreed to take her in and bring her to the local non-kill shelter the next day as she really seemed like someone's house cat. We had never seen her there before, and we went fairly frequently. In hindsight, this was not a good idea, as this cat likely has always lived there and was perfectly happy. But we took the black cat with us from a cemetery that day, and we named her Siren. Now, fast forward to nighttime, my friend had a clubhouse located fairly far in her backyard, out next to the woods. She has a fenced-in backyard with a pool, and you have to exit the fence to walk out to the clubhouse. We decided to sleep out there to add to the scary vibes. We decided to keep Siren in the clubhouse that night with us. At the time, the door on the clubhouse was broken and wouldn't close all the way or lock. We stayed up all for a while talking, maybe until one or two in the morning. But I have no idea since we didn't have cell phones at the time. Siren begins going absolutely bonkers, hissing and growling constantly, and wouldn't let you near her. Now, I'm sure it's because we uprooted this poor thing and put her in a small, unfamiliar room with unfamiliar people. My friend and I are chatting, and I hear a loud knock on the floor from underneath the clubhouse. The clubhouse is lifted on a few cement blocks, so there is definitely room for someone to crawl under. I ignore it, thinking it could be anything. Then I hear maybe one or two more times, also ignoring them. Then there's a loud knock that comes from directly underneath where my friend is sitting on the floor. She jumps, and I told her that I've heard a few knocks before, but didn't want to say anything. She said she had heard them as well, and also was trying to pretend she had not. But this one, you couldn't ignore. The knocking starts happening more frequently, seeming from multiple locations underneath us at the time. Then we hear a knock on one wall of the clubhouse as well. The knocking picks up and is very loud, eventually spreading to all four walls of the clubhouse and underneath us, surrounding us at the same time. I'm in tears at this point because I'm scared and I want to run out and make a break for her house. My friend adamantly did not want to do that because she was too afraid to leave. The knocking slash banging continues for quite some time on all four walls and underneath us simultaneously. We're trying to convince ourselves that it's maybe her dad playing a trick on us, but we couldn't explain how it could be coming from all four sides and below at once. She eventually convinces me that it's probably her cat's. So, I eventually am able to fall asleep. The knocking continued the entire time. The next morning, the knocking had stopped. My friend later tells me that she didn't think it could be her cat's, but she was trying to calm me down at the time. 
To this day, we have no idea what could have caused the knocking. It was very loud and intense at times, shaking the clubhouse. I am hoping someone may have a logical explanation. Or was it a truly demonic or unfriendly entity warning us not to be dumb kids on Halloween? As for Siren, we took her back to the cemetery the very next day and released the poor thing back to her home. All right, guys, before we jump into the next experience on the paranormal side, I'd like to address something really quick. Um, I've seen all of the comments about the ghost hunt I did in my building. I'd like to first and foremost address that I am not a stupid person, first of all. Um, I appreciate everyone's care and compassion and um, just basically caring for my myself and my daughter's well-being. So I kind of want to address that I am not stupid. I am not a person who just jumps into something and takes it lightly. Um, I have a very strong connection to my Native American side. I have participated in multiple sweats, communicated with elders, and I pray to the Great Spirit daily. I also have a very powerful religious or Roman Catholic background. I was baptized. I had my first communion. I had my confirmation. Um, so I do believe in the Trinity. I do believe the, that Lord Jesus Christ is my Savior. And I have a beautiful cross that has been blessed by a Catholic priest in my home. I have holy water in my home. And I have cleansing prayers that I perform. Um, I did talk to my local priest about these cleansing prayers and he reviewed them with me and said they were ideal for what I plan on doing. Um, I'm not going hunting for a demon or some kind of craziness. Um, I mean, I'm being very careful with what I'm doing. I just want people to know that I am being careful. Um, I've seen some comments that kind of, you know, a lot of them, the majority of them were great and uh, compassionate and kind. But then there was like a couple, like, I'm just some dumb guy doing something that, you know, I have no idea what I'm doing, this, this, and that. Um, that's the that's the furthest thing from the truth. I don't think anybody is an expert in ghost hunting. <laughs> I think that Zach Baggins knows just as much as you or I when it comes to experiences with the paranormal. Has he had more than we have? <laughs> Absolutely. He makes a living at doing that. But does he know more? No. Because unless he is a spirit or a demon or something else, then he just knows what basically we know. Or he, he I mean, he may have been more versed on reading certain things, but that are, those are things that we can learn and pick up. So there's no expert in that field. It's what you experience. Um, so I am being careful. I'm not being an idiot about this. I... I never invited them into me and I never invited them into my home. I know there is something in my home and there always has been, to be frank with you. I didn't bring it in. I gave it permission to communicate with me, but then I gave it 
I told it to let go after we were done. Um, the other t night is something I'm going to pursue. Just like with my dog man and slash cryptid, Bigfoot, what have you, uploads. I'm going to start going out in the field and doing like dog man slash Bigfoot hunts where I'm out. Someone's seen something. I'm going out there and looking. Okay. If there's a paranormal place that I'd like to go to, I'm going to approach that as the same. The channel is going in a way that I want it to go where, yes, there will always be narrations and there will always be interviews. Don't get me wrong, please. But I'm going to start doing experiencing. I'm going to start experiencing these things. I want to go out into the field, both cryptid, dogman, Bigfoot hunt, and ghost hunts. And I am prepared mentally and spiritually. My daughter is mentally and spiritually sound as well. She has a cross in her room. I know a few people are like, ah, oh, you should put a cross in her room. She has a cross in her room, actually the same exact cross I have, which was blessed by a Catholic priest. She wears a um, crucifix medallion and she prays at night. I don't know who she prays to, whether it be the Great Spirit or Jesus or whoever, as long as she prays. That's all I care about. Um, <clears throat> now, some people have, are thinking, well, if he believes in Jesus Christ, our Savior, why does he say at the end of his videos, may the Great Spirit? Well, because God isn't Jesus and Jesus isn't God. God is the Almighty. He is the Great Spirit. Um, so I kind of interwoven both of my cultures to make me comfortable. Doesn't You don't have to like it, and I'm not asking you to. But that's why I say, may the Great Spirit watch over all. Uh, may the Great Spirit watch over all of us. Take it at the end, like I'm saying, may Jesus watch, you know, watch over all of us all. Watch over all of us, excuse me. I don't know why I got tongue-tied at the end. Or whatever, whoever you may pray to. At the end, please. <clears throat> because that's all I want, is I just want, I want to, I want to learn more. I want to experience more. But I also want everyone to be safe. And just feel comfortable so that's what's going on i just wanted to share that um i didn't mean any negativity i appreciate everybody in their concerns for me i just kind of wanted to say hey you know i i'm well aware of what i'm doing i'm not having you know i didn't bring out i didn't break out the ouija board and start doing a ouija board um Thing that night I probably won't ever play with my Ouija board um, I have one and I will it stays in its one spot and um, but I'm not summoning things in so please don't think that there's already something in my home I just wanted to kind of communicate with it I kind of wanted to you know, my daughter wasn't home and I wanted to kind of show everybody what I have going on in my home. And I'm pretty sure a great deal of you have things going on in your home that you can't explain. So, you know, just tell them to leave you be and go about your day. That's what I do. Anyway. Let's get on to more of the paranormal side. All right.
by the way, thank you so much, guys. It, you guys mean the world to me. This channel means the world to me. And um, I feel blessed to have all of you in my life. So, thank you. Today's fourth experience on the paranormal side. I was born in the country of Zimbabwe in Africa. I left to live in the United Kingdom when I was 28 years old. I'm now 49 and I still live in the United Kingdom where I feel much safer, as Africa is not a very kind place to live. The country I lived in is landlocked and has a big forestry industry, which is used for export and trade. I lived most of my life on various forestry plantations, way out in isolation, remote places where very few people have lived or live. The forestry industry plants their pine trees in large blocks, with each tree being on a grid pattern. Since it's pine, nothing grows beneath them due to the soil becoming acidic. -y. So there is no ground cover or any brush or shrub. Like most remote places, the roads are really just dust without any covering, which means mud, rain, and hard-baked earth from the sun. I would take my three small terrier dogs walking each day, leaving the house after lunch, and I would usually be out for just over an hour. I walked the same route each time, up along a dirt road between two blocks of almost mature pine trees. At this point on the route, the road then curved around one block of trees and came back to meet the road from the house, forming a loop. It's a breathtaking walk with trees on both sides of you. However, the trees fall away on the right of the road halfway up, and it gives you a stunning view of the hills covered with shrubs and brush and grass. I went walking one afternoon as normal, and I heard a growl in the brush just up from my house. My three dogs fled in terror, and whatever was in the brush chased them. I found out it was a leopard with a cub, so I waited a week, then went walking again. Thankfully, there was no sign of the mama cat, and I was careful to avoid her cub zone, as I had the dogs, and they are a delicacy to leopards. About halfway into the walk, just as the trees on the right cleared away and the view opened up, I started to smell something I had never smelled before. It had a strong ammonia scent, like cat urine, but it was shocking how powerful the stench seemed to be out in the open like this. The dogs reacted in a strange way as well. They ran to me and cowered between my ankles, whimpering. I know a leopard would have spooked them into running home, so I was confused about being urine. I stood my ground with my dogs between my legs. You learn early on never to run with wild animals. And I was also armed with a handgun being a female and out alone. The smell got stronger and stronger. Then it seemed to mix with the smell of wet dog fur. By this time I'm terrified, but I didn't know why. All I knew was I felt surrounded by something that was making the hair stand up on my body. Yet I couldn't see anything. I wanted to run back the way I had come just to get away from whatever was happening out there, but I knew if I ran and it turned out to be a big cat, I was going to be attacked. So I did something that almost made me mess myself in fright. I went forward and kept moving very slowly, one step at a time along the road into the smell. Have you ever been so frightened that you can hear blood roaring in your ears? I remember my teeth were literally chattering and my dogs were milling about between my legs with their tails against their bellies. This was not a good sign. The further along the track I got, the more I looked around me and saw nothing. It's impossible, but there was nothing to see at all. How could I not see anything in a block of trees planted in straight rows with nothing growing beneath them? when I could see straight to the other side of the block along the tree row. I noticed an old gnarled tree standing alone on the right side of the road where the beautiful views were, and although the tree had not been there, had been there as long as I could remember, I stopped to look at it over. About eight feet up the tree trunk was fresh rips into the bark, but they were so deep they went into the wood below the bark. Each one looked about 15 centimeters long 
and were fresh enough to have liquid sap leaking out of them. I thought at that point it was probably a big cat, and it had stretched up along the trunk to sharpen its nails. But it occurred to me that cats pulled downwards. These cuts were at an odd angle. There were two marks on the left side and three on the right of the trunk. At about 30 degree angles, it looked like a person with long nails had reached up and started near the middle of the tree trunk and gouged outwards and down at the same time. The smell was the strongest from the tree. I kept turning and looking in all directions as I moved forward and then finally the smell just stopped. I was a long distance from the tree by then. The dogs were back to running between myself and whatever they were at currently examining. Everything was normal again. I got home safe with all three dogs, but I was too frightened to go walking again. I was 24 years old at the time. I have not had the courage to tell even my own family about this. The only one other person knows this story, and he's a skeptic and said it was probably a wild cat. A lot of strange things have happened in my life, both in Africa and the United Kingdom. Most of them are due to me seeing lights in the sky at night, especially here in the United Kingdom. One other thing that happened on the same African tree plantation was that a UFO was seen the same week as the one that landed in Rawa, where the children at the school spoke to the occupants of the unidentified craft. I'm still very confused over that one as we lost track of time when we were traveling to the fire lookout tower to see if we could see it. When we arrived, the lookout at the tower said it was gone and we chatted to the other fire tower along the mountain ridge who were there still watching as it moved slow along the country. At least we got an eyewitness account from a man who saw it, which was still really interesting. I just don't know what to think about the smell. It was so strong it burned my nose enough to make me want a tissue. So, to me, what she is describing, just what I'm thinking, and like she said, that it was not a big cat. Um, because in her first one, she saw the, the, the mother cat with her cub. The dogs ran home. The dogs did not run this time. They ran to her for her safety. And when she looked at the, the, the claw marks in the tree, how she described them, that would almost be like a human or how we, you know, grab something and pull. Or how a dog man would do it, how we've heard dog men ripping at trees. To me, it sounds like there was some sort of dog man in Africa or in Zimbabwe, which would, in my mind, if you think dog man in Africa, you think of the hyena like dog man or jackal looking dog man, which are friggin' terrifying because hyenas are terrifying. God. That's that's a terrifying upload, and I told you it was terrifying, didn't I? <laughs> anyway, moving on. Tonight's final experience on the paranormal side. So, I went through 22 weeks of infantry OSUT, and the worst experience I had was the individual night land navigation. Now, I'm in the middle of a swamp at around 2 in the morning looking at my map. Suddenly, every hair on my body stands on end, and my red light flickers. I turn it off and start looking around when I spot the silhouette of a woman in what I can only describe as a pioneer's outfit. I look away for a second and look back and nothing. I tell myself, you're just seeing stuff. I pick a direction I thought was good and start walking. I start hearing crunching and breaking of twigs and leaves in rhythm with my steps behind me, as if someone or something is matching my pace. Once again, my hair stands straight up again. I stopped and looked behind me. Nothing. I continue walking. Same thing happens. Stop, look, nothing. I decided that three points was plenty for the night, and I start booking it. As I'm running, 
I clearly hear and see something jumping from tree to tree, keeping pace with me as I caught through the wood, sprinting at full speed. I'm not the fastest, but at the time I had a five-second forty-yard. Nothing could have moved that quickly through those trees. I make it to the starting point. I turn in my crap and sit in my gear. Another guy comes running in at about 15 minutes later. We still have two hours left at this point, so it makes no sense why he'd be in a hurry. He does his crap and sits next to me and turns, Dude, did you have a point in the swamp? I gesture at my boots and pants. Yeah, can't you tell? Yeah, sorry, but anyway, did you see a woman in the pioneer outfit? Yeah, I was writing down my points of info when my light started flickering and I heard something in the tree above me. I looked up and saw her sitting in the tree above me at that point, I just staring down at me with these lifeless eyes and empty face. I ran faster than I ever have and I didn't stop till I got here. It's at this point where the guy sitting behind us leans forward. You saw her too? We nod. I started walking into the swamp when I saw her sit up out of the water and slowly turn to look at me. I froze and was like, I only broke out of it when the lieutenant walked up behind me and asked what I was looking at. I looked at him and pointed, but when I did, she was gone. No noise, nothing. This kid was an honest dude, and I could tell by the look in his eye, and he wasn't messing with us. I want to know if anyone else has had any experience with this same entity. So if anyone's done the land navigation at Fort Benning, or has seen anything at Fort Benning, please let me know. All right, folks, some very terrifying experiences to start the day off with. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you. I'd truly like to thank you all for supporting the channel. It is, after all, your support that helps the channel to continue to grow and go. And honestly, what gives people a place to share their experiences, ideas, theories, without ridicule and judgment. Simply treated with the respect that we all deserve. Thank you. Please stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant, keeping an eye on our children, pets, family, and friends. These creatures are real. They are out there, and they're definitely dangerous. Share this information with those you love and care about, and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions, never stop searching for answers, and God bless.